New on Curiosity Stream, how do you connect a 16th century potato to limitless energy production? Could Napoleon's toothpick have a direct link to a machine that predicts the future? And how can a 1700s conch shell chart a course to humans connecting their brains to the internet? James Burke's visionary series Connections returns for a new generation. Experience all new Connections with monthly annual and bundled plans. Find the one that works for you at curiositystream.com. Welcome to the Agrihood. Carnes Crossroads is a new home community with a farm-to-table lifestyle. Just outside of Charleston, here, community is defined by gathering together and our deep connection to nature. Our future farm and amenities are taking root and blooming into something you've always dreamed of in a fun, healthy, and social environment. Come home to the Agrihood, where you can plant roots and thrive. Learn more at CarnesCrossroads.com. This is Space Time, Series 23, Episode 88, for broadcast on the 28th of August, 2020. Coming up on Space Time, the world-famous Arecibo radio telescope dish seriously damaged, SOHO discovers its 4,000th comet, and SpaceX's Starlink constellation launches its 655th satellite. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. The National Science Foundation has been forced to suspend astronomical observations from its iconic Arecibo radio telescope in Puerto Rico after the 305-metre dish was seriously damaged following a cable break. Numerous panels on the parabolic reflector were destroyed when a 3-inch auxiliary cable suddenly snapped, causing a 31-metre gash across the dish's surface. The cable also damaged up to eight panels in the Gregorian Dome, which houses the Alpha multi-beam receiver, and it twisted a platform used to access the dome. Engineers are now reviewing the damage and assessing the sort of repairs needed to bring the world-famous facility back online. We'll keep you informed. This is Space Time. Still to come, SOHO discovers its 4,000th comet, and SpaceX's Starlink constellation launches its 655th satellite. All that and more still to come on Space Time. The Solar and Heliospheric Observatory spacecraft SOHO has discovered its 4,000th comet. Jointly operated by NASA and the European Space Agency, SOHO was launched way back in December 1995 aboard an Atlas II rocket, they don't even make that anymore, from Space Launch Complex 36B at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Base in Florida. That launch complex doesn't exist anymore either. It was initially on a two-year mission to study the sun's interior, as well as its coromosphere, transition region, corona, and solar wind. The probe was placed into the Lagrangian L1 position, where the gravitational pull of the Earth and the sun cancel each other out, allowing a spacecraft at that location to remain in a stable halo orbit at that position relative to the Earth as it orbits the sun. The mission's been so successful, it's been extended multiple times and is now expected to last at least until 2022. This report from NASA TV. SOHO stands for Solar Heliospheric Observatory, and it's a mission that was launched by ESA, the European Space Agency, and NASA in 1995 to study the sun. The sun is a star, and the universe is made up of stars. But the sun is very close to us. We're able to see the sun in great detail. So if we can understand our sun, then that allows us to have a better understanding of the rest of the stars and, the, and consequently the rest of the universe. Well, the first time I saw a SOHO image, my reaction was basically, wow. I was blown away. I've never seen the, the kinds of detail, the kinds of structure, the kinds of dynamics that were going on and any sort of image of the sun before. And I think that this is probably true for a lot of scientists. One of the ways that SOHO studies the corona 
is using what we call a coronagraph. And so a coronagraph creates an artificial eclipse because the sun itself, the surface of the sun, is about a million times brighter than this outer structure of the corona. We need to block that bright disk out so that you can see the much fainter outer corona. Using SOHO and using technique called helioseismology, very similar to seismology on the Earth, we were actually able to see inside the sun. And so what we were able to do is see the layer of the sun just below the visible surface that we call the convection zone. And that's where all sorts of dynamics are going on. The inside of the sun is bubbling up to the surface. And that's really where all of the, the solar phenomena that we see is first developed. And so we were able to see underneath the surface and see these flows of solar plasma, see the formation of sunspots. And this is something that's never been done before. We're actually able to see the details inside of a star. And that report from NASA TV featured Alex Young from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. The comet was detected by the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory's Large Angle Spectroscopic Chronograph Instrument aboard SOHO. The instrument's designed to see extremely faint emissions from the solar corona, the sun's outer atmosphere. But during its quarter of a century of operations, the instrument's also turned out to be a somewhat more than capable comet hunter, discovering well over half of all known comets. These included many that would otherwise be completely unobservable from Earth due to their proximity to the sun. Jonathan Alley, the editor of Australian Sky Telescope magazine, says the majority of these comets were detected by citizen scientists as part of the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory Managed Sun Grace project. So SWAN is an acronym and it describes one of the instruments that's aboard a spacecraft called SOHO, which also is an acronym, the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory. Now this is a spacecraft that's been out there in space for years and years and years and its job is just to look at the sun. It just stares at the sun all day long, gathering data about the sun and then we're learning lots and lots of great things about the sun. And so it's taking pictures of the sun all the time. But there are, there are byproducts of this, um, sort of um, accidental serendipitous byproducts of this and that is that sometimes you get little comets that are too small or um, too, too small or too distant to be noticed otherwise, but when they get close to the sun, like really, really close, um, very, very sun close. Sun grazes. They, yeah, they're called sun grazes, and what happens is they get very close to the sun, and the sun heats them up, and all the gas and stuff comes off the comet, and you get this big gas cloud around it, and sometimes a little tail, uh, and then you can notice them, right? Uh, you don't normally notice them from here on Earth because they're too close to the sun to be seen, but... The, the wavelength and everything that the SOHO spacecraft looks at the sun in uh, and the way that it can block the sunlight out from the sun itself and see the surrounding space means that these comets turn up on the pictures taken by the spacecraft. And some people um, you know, have discovered lots of comets just by going through the data that comes back day by day from this SOHO spacecraft. It's actually now just racked up its 4,000th comet, uh, the SOHO spacecraft, and eight of those have been discovered by an Aussie amateur astronomer, a guy called Michael Mattiazzo, who's a pathologist by day, but a, a comet hunter. Well, I was going to say comet hunter by night, but you don't have to do this at night. You can just go through the data any time you like. He gets the data from the SOHO spacecraft and analyzes it, and, and he has spotted eight of these things now, which is pretty good going, I think. Does he get and to name them? Uh, no, you don't get to name them. <clears throat> they do end up with a catalog name. But uh, you only get to name a comet like that if you use your own equipment, so your own telescope in your backyard. So uh, these ones, you're using data taken by an instrument on board a spacecraft that belongs to someone else. So it does end up with a catalogue number, but it doesn't get your name on it. If you go out with your backyard telescope and find a comet that no one's ever seen before, yeah, it will get your name tapped onto it. That's Jonathan Alley, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. And don't forget, if you're having trouble getting your copy of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine from your usual retailer because of the current lockdown and travel restrictions, you can always get a print or digital subscription and have the magazine delivered directly to your letterbox or inbox. Subscribing's easy. Just go to skyandtelescope.com.au. That's skyandtelescope.com.au and you'll never be left in the dark again.
Hello, saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC. SpaceX has completed its 11th Starlink launch with another 58 of the broadband internet satellites placed into orbit. The mission aboard a Falcon 9 rocket from Space Launch Complex 40 at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida also carried three Planet Skysats. My name is Kate Tice and I'm a senior certification engineer here at SpaceX. This morning's launch represents a couple of milestones, our 14th mission of 2020, our 90th Falcon 9 mission, and the first time for reusing a booster for the sixth time. To date, we've launched nearly 600 Starlink satellites to orbit. As a reminder, Starlink is a constellation of satellites that can provide high-speed, low-latency internet all over the globe, particularly in remote or rural areas where connectivity is limited or completely unavailable. We have three small sat passengers on board today's mission for our customer planet, the operators of the largest constellation of Earth observation satellites. You may remember we also successfully launched three Skysats for Planet on a Starlink mission in June earlier this year. The satellites on today's mission will enable high-resolution imaging of a single location up to 12 times a day. They'll be joining 18 Skysats already in orbit, completing Planet's fleet of 21 satellites, making it the largest high-resolution fleet of satellites in orbit to date. Now, in order to make room for those three rideshare passengers, we will be launching 58 Starlink satellites today into low Earth orbit instead of the usual 60, as we have done in the past. And right now, all systems are go for an on-time liftoff this morning. Falcon 9 stands 70 meters tall, which is just greater than the wingspan of a 747 aircraft. Today's flight will be the sixth flight for this booster. It previously supported the Telstar 18 Vantage mission, Iridium 8, the first Starlink mission, as well as the third and eighth Starlink missions. And this will mark the first time that we're flying a booster for its sixth mission. The first stage has nine Merlin engines that do the bulk of the work to get Falcon 9 off the ground and up into the thinner parts of the Earth's atmosphere before separating from second stage and making its way back down to Earth for landing. We will be attempting to recover this first stage for the sixth time. Uh, this time we'll be doing that on our drone ship, Of Course I Still Love You, which is currently stationed in the Atlantic Ocean, about 350 nautical miles northeast of our Cape Canaveral, Florida launch site. On top of the first stage is the inner stage. The reason it's black, as opposed to the rest of the vehicle, is because it is unpainted TPS, or thermal protective system. And that TPS is what protects the composite material in which the inner stage is made out of. The inner stage is what connects the first stage to the second stage and protects the second stage's single Merlin vacuum or MVAC engine during launch. That MVAC engine ignites after the first stage separates and will propel the second stage along with planets three Skysats and our 58 Starlink satellites into an elliptical orbit above Earth's surface. Falcon 9 has been loading propellants since T minus 35 minutes. As a reminder, Falcon 9 uses a rocket-grade kerosene, which we call RP-1, for our fuel, and super-chilled liquid oxygen, or LOX, as our oxidizer. Currently, uh, RP-1 and LOX are nearly fully loaded on both stages, and liquid oxygen will continue to be topped off right until the last minutes of the countdown. The stack of 58 Starlink satellites and three Skysats are safely enclosed right inside of that structure, our payload fairing, which is a 17-foot diameter structure at the top of the rocket. The fairing protects the satellites from aerothermal heating, aerodynamic loads, and contamination during the ascent phase. Once we reach the vacuum of space, we'll jettison those fairing halves while the second stage will continue on to orbit. The fairing halves that we're using today previously flew on the Starlink mission that we launched earlier this year in January. We will be attempting to recover our, these fairing halves today using our recovery ships, Ms. Chief and Ms. Tree. Uh, the vehicle, the satellites, and the weather, and the range are all looking good for an on-time liftoff of 10.31 a.m. Eastern. 
stage two, press for flight. LDs, go for launch. Okay, so we're in the final phases of the countdown. Let's stage watch as Falcon 9 takes on Starlink satellites and three minutes sky 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 sets into orbit. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Zero, ignition, and lift off of the Falcon 9, go Starlink. A successful liftoff of Falcon 9 Power from Space Launch Nominal. Complex 40 for this 11th Starlink mission. The three planet Skysats and our 58 Starlink satellites are on their way to space. Merlin engines Vehicle are now throttling supersonic. down as they anticipate the moment of greatest aerodynamic pressure. Max Q. All right, we just went through Max Q, and the vehicle is now supersonic, and Merlin engines have throttled back up. So coming up in about a minute, we'll have three events happening back to back. First will be main engine cutoff, or MECO. This is where all nine Merlin engines will shut off to slow the vehicle down in preparation for the second the event, stage started. separation. This is where the first stage separates from the second stage, with sta stage one starting to make its way back to Earth for landing, while second stage will kick off the third event of, in this sequence, SCS-1, or second engine start one. This is where that Merlin vacuum engine will ignite and begin to propel the second stage along with our payloads into orbit. Everything continuing to look nominal for stage one. We have Miko. Stage separation confirmed. And impact ignition. All right, so there we saw those three events all happen in quick succession. Stage one is now making its way back to Earth. The grid fins slowly deploying. The Merlin vacuum engine beginning to develop that healthy orange glow as it continues it's journey on to orbit. Fairing separation confirmed. Bermuda acquisition of signal. Continuing nominally. While the second stage is continuing to do its job, the first stage is making its way back home to Earth. In the next few minutes, it will be executing two burns. The first is the entry burn, where three of the Merlin engines at the bottom of the first stage will light up and begin to slow the stage down as it re-enters the upper part of the Earth's atmosphere. The second burn is known as the landing burn. This is a single engine burn that will bring the vehicle speed down rapidly in order to make a soft landing on the drone ship. Stage one coasting, using nothing but those grid fins, some articulate here and there as they continue to steer. And we also utilize nitrogen gas uh, for occasional little bursts of that nitrogen gas and we use that for attitude control. Second stage continuing nominally now at one and a half G's for acceleration. Stage one entry burn startup. Stage two continues on nominal trajectory. Again this burn utilizes three engines at the base of the rocket and stage there one, we entry can burn see the entry down. burn has concluded. Second stage trajectory is still looking nominal. Terminal guidance. Stage one, landing burn. And landing burn has begun. Touchdown and shutoff. Successful one, landing, landing of the first stage booster. Once again, this is the sixth time that we have utilized this booster on a mission. Also marking its sixth landing. So turning our attention back to second stage, we've had confirmation of second engine cutoff or SECO-1. And we also have confirmation of a good orbit. The three planet Skysats were deployed sequentially beginning about 12 and a half minutes after launch, followed 26 minutes later by the Starlink satellites. This mission now brings the total Starlink satellite constellation up to 655 of the orbiting spacecraft. This is space time. Wells Fargo presents one of the surest ways to grow your money. A Wells Fargo CD account, where you can earn a 5.00% annual percentage yield on an 11-month term with a minimum opening deposit of $5,000. Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash CD rates to open a CD account and start growing your savings with us. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. It now seems the COVID-19 coronavirus could be as deadly as the 1918 flu pandemic. 
Current World Health Organization figures show that more than 22 million people have now been infected with COVID-19, and the disease has killed more than 800,000 people since it first emerged in Wuhan, China. Now, a report in the Journal of the American Medical Association warns that deaths linked to the COVID-19 pandemic in New York are on par with the peak death rate seen during the 1918 influenza pandemic. During the peak of the 1918 H1N1 influenza outbreak in New York City, there were around 287.17 deaths per 100,000 person months, compared to 202.08 deaths per 100,000 person months during the first few months of the COVID-19 pandemic. However, the 1918 flu pandemic also started from a higher baseline. And prior to the current pandemic, the starting death rate was much lower, thanks in part to modern medicine. Which means the relative increase in deaths is actually much greater for COVID-19 than during the peak of the 1918 H1N1 influenza pandemic. A new study warns that 22 Australian native freshwater fish species are likely to become extinct within the next 20 years unless there's new conservation action to save them. Ten of the doomed species are in Victoria, five in Queensland, New South Wales is four, Western Australia two, and one in Tasmania. You can read the study in full in the Journal of Pacific Conservation Biology. A German researcher has developed new algorithms that can distinguish between troll messages and those tweeted by public figures on Twitter using as few as 50 tweets. Previous studies have identified key features in troll tweets, such as timing, hashtags and geographical location. But the new study, reported in the journal PLOS One, looked at the language of the tweets themselves, identifying distinctive patterns of repeated words which can be used to spot a Twitter troll. This approach was able to distinguish between troll tweets, and the technique may be useful for combating online misinformation campaigns. Well, good news for all those mammals out there. That is, middle-aged men in Lycra. It seems stopping for that cup of coffee on your morning bike ride may actually help your cycling performance. A report in the journal PLOS One claims caffeine improved power output by 8% in a cycling time trial. Researchers found that cyclists attacked the first kilometre of a four-kilometre time trial more aggressively when they ingested caffeine rather than the placebo. For almost 40 years now, Australian sceptics have been offering up to $100,000 in cold hard cash to anyone claiming to have supernatural, paranormal or occult abilities and are willing to prove it under proper scientific test conditions. Many have tried, but so far none have proven themselves. And for more than two decades now, the US Centre for Inquiry Investigations Group has offered a similar $100,000 prize. And again, no one has ever succeeded. So, the US group are now raising the stakes, bumping their offer up to a cool quarter of a million dollars. But Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics says there's still a menagerie of self-professed psychics and mediums in both countries who claim to have special psychic, telepathic or telekinetic abilities, but for some reason are unwilling to prove their claims under proper scientific examination. We've had a challenge for 40 years. In fact, the sceptics started off with a challenge to water diviners. And at that stage, I think Dick Smith and Philip Adams and uh, various people got together and put up $10,000 to anyone who could prove water divining. This was, this was in 1980, so it goes back that far. So we've had a challenge since then. And me, as being on the front line of the sceptics, I receive applications for the challenge every week, right? Wow. And it's now, yeah, oh, absolutely. And it now stands up, stands at $100,000. And it's real money. We actually have the money. It's put aside so you know if someone does win it they're going to get it the interesting thing is when you first ask someone what is their skill they then often get a bit vague or it's a vague skill like i can tell if someone's going to be sick in the next 20 years yeah great and then you ask them how would you test it and they start getting it gets difficult for them at that stage most people when you say there's a test about 95 percent drop out they think they can just phone up and say i can do this where's the money and so most of them by and large yeah the huge majority drop out at that stage when they have to do a test that's going to tell you a lot about their iq then. well yeah we say we say in that document, yeah, you're going to be scientifically tested, you know, and they really just pass over that. But yeah, there are enough people who think, yes, I can be tested. And then you try and figure out what sort of test, because any test we do has to be mutually agreed. Both sides have to understand what the test is. It's and got both to have the to... scientific method too, surely. Yeah, absolutely. If, if one person, so no one can say after the test, oh, that wasn't a fair test, even though they do that anyway. But if you agree beforehand, this is the test, and this is, we both come to an agreement that this is what the test is, it satisfies both people's criteria for a fair test, then you do it. And what we 
have is an initial test just to see what people's skills are under controlled conditions. And then if they can indicate there's something of interest there, they will go for a proper full test, full heavyweight scientific test. And that's where the $100,000 comes into play. And how many times and, have you lost uh, this money? Never. In round figures? <laughs> None. <laughs> Zero. We, we don't even have we don't even have people who uh, get past the first test, and we have we've probably tested about a couple of hundred people over the years. People who have got through that first stage of saying, "Yeah, let's figure out what a test is." So we've done tests of a lot of people. A lot of them are water diviners who are lovely people. They certainly genuinely believe that they have this skill, as opposed to a lot of other people who claim skills. A lot of psychics. Psychic is probably easier than a medium. Someone who's sort of seen the dead, but then you ask them for something concrete, and most psychics, and especially those who speak to the dead, will give you such a, a waffly sort of response and answer that it really doesn't satisfy anyone except for someone who's desperate to hear. You have to try and think of something very, very specific. And these days, the sophisticated psychic will do a lot of background research. And it's amazing how much information people give out about themselves on Facebook and things like that. Oh, yeah. um, so I, and I had someone who was, came to me very desperate saying that this psychic has said something about a friend. Mm-hmm. Saying, how do they know it? And I said, yeah. And I said, I found that in about five minutes, all the things that would point to what the psychic's saying on this person's Facebook page. It's so easy. You can ask psychics a whole range of things. You can ask, you know, if you can pin them down. One test of a psychic was someone who could send messages to someone else in America. And we had people in America waiting to look after the people on that end. And they could send, we set up simple words like, you know, you know, like the thing about 10 poets or that sort of thing, or 10 animals or that sort of thing, which has been, you try not to have the obvious ones. Yeah. And then you choose something unusual. So it has more chance of being real if they can do it. So we've done people with, yeah, we've actually gone through to an end of a test of this initial test. And and discuss the results and if it's purely by chance you say well that's you know I could do that if it's just tossing a coin but so they have to perform much better than chance to even sort of have us slightly interested the skeptics guide to the universe do an annual end of year prediction test where everyone in the group yeah. predicts something for the following year and at the end of the year they see how good their predictions were and they compare themselves to so-called professional mediums and psychics and things like that and it's all pure chance we are currently undergoing with australian skeptics mainly through richard saunders who's one of our community members is doing an assessment of psychics predictions over the last 15, 20 years. These predictions that psychics make in magazines, especially at the start of a year, about the coming 12 months. And the usual thing, the royal family will announce a baby. Yeah, 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 don't they always? Someone in the royal family is going to have a baby. So we've looked at these, and it's an ongoing project. It's just grown like topsy, as you say. And we've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these things to assess, and it takes a while to assess because you have to look at it. Is it an actual testable claim? And like, is there something definitely said? Or there will be an earthquake somewhere in the world? Yeah, thanks a lot. Doesn't help. Can so you be more to, specific? They've got to be somewhat specific in, in uh Yeah, in so you can actually look at it to see if it happens. I mean, there are some which are just obvious. A politician will have a scandal. Yeah, really? You know, <laughs> <laughs> knock me over with a feather. But I mean, so we, we had this project underway, and hopefully it was supposed to be reporting at the end of last year or early last year, and it just keeps growing and growing and growing, and the people working on it keep discovering more and more predictions, and they have to stop at some stage. But the preliminary result is that about 10% are interesting, not necessarily even saying correct, but they're close. So if someone came to you and said, I can get this right one out of every 10 times, if that was your car mechanic, I wouldn't use them. And the same with psychics. And really the ones they're getting right are sort of pretty obvious in most cases. Yeah, so that's testing psychics. You can test psychics, but most of them don't want to be tested. Some of them say, oh, I don't want the money. And this is where we talk about the $250,000 challenge or our $100,000 challenge. Who doesn't want $100,000 or $250,000? Well, that's what what we say. And we say, if because you say you can do this, all you've got to do is do what you say you can do and you'll get the money. Oh, I don't want to sell you with money. Well, you, you take oh, money from clients, don't you? Yeah, but this is... Well, see, well, don't keep it. Give it to a charity. We'll still give you the 100000 and we'll, we'll give it to a charity on your behalf, right? But no, they don't want to be tested because, frankly, I think, would they all fail? Would they all be exposed? Whatever. We've had psychics who come to us and saying every other psychic out there is a shock, except for me. Not a lot of love loss in the psychic community. Has there anyone who's ever even come close? No. Out of those we've tested... No one has got more than chance. Yeah. Like, yeah, when you do a test and saying, like a water diviner, is this container full of sand or is it full of water? Something as simple as that. The average is they'll get 50 50. So, no, we've had no indication amongst diviners or psychics or astrologers or psychometrists or anyone you care to name. Psych- that's a new uh, one for me, psychometrists. Yeah, that's psychics who can read you from things that you own. Okay. Right, things that are close to you. Hand them a Mercedes car key and they'll make some assumptions about you. We've tested some and we've actually given them things like pens. Yeah. And they don't like that. This has been close to me. I use this borrow all the time. Exactly. You know, but no. 
And uh, I said, well, therefore, you're reading something else, aren't you? You're not reading the object. That's Tim Mindham from Australian Skeptics. And that's the show for now. Space Time is broadcast on Science Zone Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and through both iHeartRadio and on TuneIn Radio. Or you can subscribe and download Space Time as a free podcast through Apple, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, Spotify, YouTube, Audio Boom, Podbeam, Android, Castbox, from Spacetime with Stuart Gary.com, or from your favorite download podcast provider. You can help support the show and the work we do by visiting the Spacetime online shop and grabbing yourself a few goodies, or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to commercial free double episode versions of the show, as well as bonus audio content and other rewards. Just go to our Patreon page through Spacetime with Stuart Gary.com for all the details. If you want more space time, check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lower case, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. 